Thank you, Chairman. Well, <clears throat> since this uh, uh, panel discussed about the di redistribution of power, I will uh, uh, spend the five minutes on that. And uh, from my understanding, because of the China's rise and the Americans' relative decline, actually, American the relative decline only relative to China. America actually is in large its strength and capability with uh, all of the rest of the world except China. So China, U.S. is actually gaining its uh, new strength, just not fast enough to, uh, in comparison with China. So that, what it means? It means that in the coming decade and in the, at global level, we are going to have a bipolarization. That means uh, China and the U.S. will have this bipolarization and the lesser, lesser states have to and, uh, uh, take sides between China and the U.S. And actually, it's already happened. And in East Asia, China uh, alliance, uh, not alliance, China actually cooperated with Russia and Japan cooperated with the U.S. In the Europe and the U.S. cooperated with the uh, 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 U.S. and the Russia and cooperated with China. I think this already happened. So more and more, the other countries have to uh, become uh, feel very difficult to maintain the neutral between these two giants. And uh, uh, I don't think that is the purpose for U.S. and China to force these countries to take a size. It's a, this is this country's own decision, and they have to do the measurement. And uh, taking size will benefit more, or they benefit more by taking a neutral stance. That's the really driven. This policy was driven by their uh, own interests. And uh, meanwhile, in concerning this, I think the competition between China and the U.S. will be very, very different from that between the U.S. and the uh, Soviet Union during the Cold War. So now when people use the terms of the new Cold War, I doubt it. And before we have a clear definition about what is a Cold War, and uh, I don't think we know whether we have a new Cold War or not. Cold War means the proxy war between superpowers. I doubt in the next 10 years we can see any pr proxy war between China and the U.S. And if you say trade war is the Cold War, then that means uh, the Cold War period mainly because uh, the trade conflicts between the Japan and the U.S. I don't think that anyone thinks this makes sense. Cold War refers to the confrontation between U.S. and uh, Russia, the uh, Soviet Union, instead of the trade, conf trade war between the U.S. and the, uh, the Japan. So nowadays, from my understanding, many people prefer to use the Cold War to describe the relationship between China and U.S. It's just because they don't know what kind of international policy we are going to have. So they only use what they're familiar and use an a old bottle to, con uh, to, uh, to contain the new wines. The new wine is totally, the new one could be liquor, and it is not wine. It is, uh, could be the uh, beer, and it's a, a not a vodka. So you cannot use the old bottle to uh, 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 bottle the new one. So then why I think the Cold War cannot happen because uh, the, the core uh, uh, engine behind the Cold War is an ideological confrontation. And both US and the Soviet Union want to advance their ideology. Now we find that uh, neither China and the US has that kind of motivation. They think this is too costly. It's not because they learned from the history because they are so selfish. Because they say, that, hey, I don't want to spend money on that. I don't think I can make big money from advancing uh, uh, ideology. Because you have to pay. Advancing ideology is very expensive. It's costly. It may block your economic growth. So from my understanding, as long as China and the US has no interest to advance their ideology, I don't think there will be Cold War. And I certainly agree with the professor argue that a nuclear weapon is the base. And if the nuclear weapons prevent the direct war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, why it fails the function to prevent the war between China and the U.S.? I think nuclear weapons is very, very effective and prevent the war between, direct war between China and the U.S. Not only that, nuclear weapons even prevent the war between the U.S. and North Korea. So any tiny country possess nuclear weapons will mean that no country dare to attack them, right? So nuclear weapons maintain to protect the peace for the world today. Second, and the, 
the power distribution at the international level will be different, a global level will be different at the regional level. And in uh, Middle East, and we are going to see the five countries, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Turkey, e uh, uh, Egypt, and the, the Iran. The five guys com compete uh, for the regional uh, hegemon. And uh, in the uh, Latin America, the Brazil was dominant in that region. In, the, uh, in uh, Black Africa, you will see there's a South Africa, and Kenya, and Nigeria, and the uh, Zaire. These four countries split the continent. There's no uh, uh, linkage among these uh, uh, respected re uh, sub-regions. Europe is a very, very unique. And I don't know, how do you define the Europe geographically? Including Russia or not? I don't know. And even Russia himself doesn't know. They don't know whether they are part of the Europe or not. And if we define, include the Russia as a European state, my understanding, there's a bipolarization between the Russia and uh, Germany. Germany is the dominant power in the Western uh, Europe. If the Russia was excluded from the Europe, and uh, for the Europeans said, no, 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 Russia is not Europeans. And then this region is a unipolar system. Okay, regional, regionally, and the, uh, uh, Germany becomes a dominant power. I think uh, Germany will maintain its, uh, 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 what, the, the growth of the strengths, and enlarge the strength gap with uh, all of the other European states, including the UK and the France. And uh, I'm sorry, France obviously and it uh, becomes uh, have a less and less uh, leading influence in this region, right? So what? Uh, the, let me uh, wrap, uh, wrap up my uh, uh, arguments. And in the coming decades, I don't think we will have a global leadership. Bipolarization means neither China or U.S. have the capability or resources to provide a leadership. Unfortunately, these two guys do not work together. That means that there's no G2. If we, you regard it as the U.S. and the Russia, Soviet Union provide a G2 leadership, well, I, I will say agree. China and the U.S. can provide a kind of a leadership like the Soviet Union and the U.S. If you think the U.S. and the Soviet Union never pro provide a joint leadership, and uh, for the next decade, I don't think China and the U.S. will do it. They cannot. It's beyond their capability. And uh, second, I don't think China and the U.S., neither China and the U.S. has the capability to involve the regionally. And I think Trump is going to get troops out of this uh, uh, Middle East and uh, in, uh, in his term. And he, he has no interest in it. And China definitely tried to avoid all of these uh, regional conflicts. And uh, we know that we, we don't have that capability. If the China and the U.S. has no interest to be involved in the regional politics, what do I mean? That means that every region were dominated by their local, conflict, uh, uh, local competition, local uh, rivalry. So finally, I say, in the coming decades, possibly we will see the world, world order will be undermined by regional confrontations rather than the confrontation between China and the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yan. Um, you know, we've been incredibly fantastically not only articulate but disciplined in this, and we actually have an hour left. So I know I want to come to all of you, but we also have a little bit of time to have a little bit of a conversation up here maybe before uh, we do that. And, you know, you've all been very uh, kind of uh, eloquent in different ways about the big structural forces that are driving this trilateral uh, relationship strategies, whether real or imputed, um, all of those things. But I mean, obviously, if we look over the sort of sweep of historical experience in great power competitions, stuff goes wrong. Accidents happen. There's brinkmanship. There's miscalculation. Um, so I thought maybe we could just talk a moment about that. Um, feelings about stability, whether this is inherently stable or unstable. Uh, but what could go wrong, whether it's in Kaliningrad or in the South China Sea, or in Syria, for that matter, where you know nuclear nuclear deterrence aside, miscalculation is still is still possible. And you know you think um, if you think back to your exam in 1914, where uh, yes, there were these big forces of, of of competition and people were worried about these things, uh, but there was an assumption of stability which was shattered in a period of weeks at a time when I think we would all agree things moved a lot more slowly than they do today. So what could go wrong? What could go wrong? 
<coughs> Yvonne, you like to talk about, please. <coughs> well, my understanding that nowadays, if we want to maintain the current uh, 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 international order, <laughs> or need, we do need a kind of uh, uh, cooperation at the global level. That means uh, how to find this kind of, uh, how to share the responsibility for maintaining the peace. And now everyone blame the others. Hey, you didn't undertake the responsibility. People forget that. The responsibility is based on the cost, based on the money, based on the price. So everyone wants to enjoy the peace, but no one wants to pay for it. So now, from my understanding, the international community need to discuss how do we share the responsibilities. And we cannot, you cannot expect China or the US unilaterally undertake the responsibility. I do not stand as a Trump side. I don't think it is right to shape, up, uh, shape off the uh, shoulder of this uh, the, 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 uh, uh, responsibility. US is the large, uh, largest uh, country, the strongest country, and the only superpower, certainly US should undertake the more responsibility than others. But meanwhile, how about the other countries? If everyone prefer to take the free ride, who is going to offer the ride? No one offer the ride, and then there's no free ride. So from understanding now, is we really come to this period to discussing about the global security uh, responsibility. And uh, what responsibility superpower should they undertake? What the uh, regional power uh, responsibility for, for, the, uh, for the regional power? And what are these uh, uh, small countries and what the responsibility they should undertake? Other thoughts? What could go wrong? Yvonne? Of course, there are. Yeah, uh, three factors that can allow everything easily to go wrong. One is we talk about states, but all these states are very unstable. And if you can see some of the foreign policy moves, including the annexation of Crimea, you're going to see that if in 19th century, 20th century, basically you mobilize domestic resources in order to project power abroad, now you're trying to mobilize global resources to project stability at home. And from this point of view, this is becoming one of the major sources of instability. To what extent you're going to have a foreign policy moves that are going to be very much overtaken, keeping domestic political considerations. And this is one of the bad things that in a certain way came with the annexation of Crimea. Getting territory works. The politics of pride works. I mean domestically, nationalistic uh, type of a sentiment works. Uh, secondly, the cyber weapon. This is the major difference between nuclear and cyber. You have nuclear in order not to use it. Cyber you can use many times. It is not the weapon for destruction. It is the weapon for disruption. And also it's much more kind of deniable who did it, how did it, and so on. So from this point of view, the idea of miscalculating, if you attack by nuclear weapon, you very clearly know who it is. And to be honest, you also know what you should do and how much time you have to respond. With the cyber, the effects can be very devastating, but you can never be very much sure where it comes from, why it comes from, and so on. So I see the cyber is a very much destabilizing because of the nature of the weapon itself. And the third, there was a, fam a great study being done by the Harvard colleagues showing how much the nature and the outcome of the asymmetrical wars changed over the last hundred years. So in the last 50 years of the 19th century, when you have a clash between the powers which are very much asymmetrical in power terms, I mean much richer, much military stronger power, fighting a much weaker power, in more than 80% of the cases, the bigger power prevails. In the last 50 years of this uh, days, in 55%, the weaker powers manage to achieve it's uh, some of its objectives. So from this point of view, even this kind of a power symmetry is not going to be enough because you can see the level of commitment, the local story and so on. So this type of regionalization of the world, for example, that you are projecting, this is going to be a very unstable world. This is going to be a very unstable world because stabilizing it from outside is going to be extremely costly. Well, can I, can I? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, certainly I agree with my colleague that I also mentioned about the cyber. Uh, we all know that uh, one thing dif uh, differ between nuclear and cyber is just uh, cyber there's no deterrence. I mean, the first uh, users has a tremendous advantage. We do not have any way to prevent 
I mean, just one computer, one device. And also, we, I mean, I'm not so sure about the nuclear I mean, it's a weapon is a reason for stability because now North Korea has it, then Japan can have it, South Korea can have it, Taiwan can have it. You do see the proliferation of a nuclear weapon. This increased tremendously about the danger. We really live in a dangerous uh, time. Now, I want to add two more things. One is the global financial instability, and we do not know when the crisis will occur, but uh, it's uh, not a uh, sound um, economic system at the moment. And secondly, domestic uh, factors become increasingly important uh, shape the international behaviors. Uh, so major powers, even not the, uh, the so-called superpower, like uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's China's superpower because it's far more influence, but with the, the recent decision by President Xi Jinping wanted to have a term limit, China is divided in this issue. There are more criticism in China than outside the world about that. So United States is still obvious, it's very divided. So this kind of domestic uh, uh, politics and uh, with some uh, winners and a lot of losers, I mean, it's not a good picture. So you talk about the unexpected. Unexpected is just something we still do not know, but we know the environment is become inconducive for peace and prosperity. Tony, what could go wrong? Well, lots can go wrong, but there's a list that everybody would mention Syria is obviously on one of them, the possibility of the U.S. and Russia coming into conflict in Syria, or NATO allies coming into conflict in Syria, uh, U.S. and Turkey being one example, piece of U.S. support for the Kurds. That's one obvious uh, point on the list. The other is Iran, if the Iran nuclear agreement uh, starts unraveling because of various um, things occurring. This administration has been criticizing it so far. We haven't, with, we haven't withdrawn. Um, but certainly the, the falling apart of that agreement would lead to instability in the region. The third, obviously, is North Korea, and there's still the possibility of miscalculation in North Korea. So far, the advisors of this president has, uh, have convinced this president not to take a precipitate military action there. The fourth is the reemergence of the Israel-Palestine dispute, but that's actually not what I want to talk about. What actually I think is, should be on our list is what Fareed Zakari has mentioned de is democratic recession. And by that, I think he means the phenomenon that is really new here. And what's new is that democratically elected governments are moving in an illiberal direction in many instances, not just Poland or Hungary or Israel or Turkey, um, but there are many examples of this phenomenon which I don't think we've seen in the past. We've seen autocratic regimes obviously be illiberal by their very nature, but now we're seeing democratic elected regimes by the will of their own people taking action against uh, ju judiciary and the media and moving in that direction. That I think is a very worrisome development and I think one that uh, weakens, uh, certainly weakens democratic systems. With identity politics woven into all of this, which makes it very, very difficult given public opinion to back off of some of these things that can go wrong. Um, another force for instability. Dr. He, did you want to come in on this or? Uh, yeah. What could go wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, today I think uh, we talk some, a lot about our um, risks, a lot about our problem about in international society. I think the, the, the essence of the problem is that uh, 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 when we look at the world, we found that uh, today's world, the order of the world has changed. Uh, most of us, I, I think most uh, of, the, uh, of the conference and the, uh, all, the, all the other forums just talk about, uh, talk about the, the liberal order. Because I think, I think the liberal order just changes, so we, today we have a lot of problems. Actually, you know, uh, China is, uh, is also the beneficiary of, of the uh, liberal order. And so, but I, uh, for me, there is a puzzle for me that is uh, what people did not expect was the, uh, the rich uh, countries, just like all the Western countries, would be hostile to the order uh, by the, uh, you know, the order that which they created by themselves. Uh, under Trump's push, I think the United States uh, threatened to abandon U.S. economic leadership for global affairs and the, uh, uh, because the economic nationalism and encouraging uh, allies to take more uh, responsibi uh, responsibility. And also Britain also did something similar with the drawing from the European Union. 
And uh, so um, uh, for, for, the Europe, for the Europe, I think, uh, as we know, Europe is a normative power. Uh, it's famous for its normative power in the world. But today, as, as we know from the Munich Conf uh, Security Conference, as we know, the Europe European field that is very uh, anxiety about the world because, you know, because of the, the world, the U.S., because of the U.S. So I think uh, today the Euro European uh, began to talk something about the military power. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, backward to the history or backward to, the, uh, to something else. Uh, so I think uh, it's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe it's a kind of anxiety, but uh, I think we should reflect or we should consider why we, uh, why the normative power of Europe will consider the, its, uh, its uh, minative power. So I think that it's a very, uh, uh, you know, big issue. But I think, you know, for the major power, uh, include the European or uh, China and Russia and the U.S., uh, I think there are a lot of things we uh, uh, or risk uh, uh, in, in today's world which we, we need to do and we need to, to uh, together to do, such as the terrorism, the number of proliferation, uh, or the uh, the uh, sluggish of the uh, of our world economy. So I think uh, in the future, for the majors, for the major power, I think we should uh, uh, just as our professor. Yan said, we should talk more about our responsibility to, our mo to talk about uh, how to share our, our responsibility and how to share our future and how to share the power uh, of us. And so I think it's, uh, 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 so I think the cooperation coordination is the is only way to find the, this, uh, uh, you know, to find the only way to, to, to solve this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanasius. What are the flashpoints? Two points, Ian. First, on what go, can go wrong, and second, on Cold War. Conflict in the South China Sea. If you see the naval activity last year, it was tremendous. When Trump visited China, was accompanied by three aircraft carriers, and each aircraft carrier it was a bad group with 50 ships, submarines, and all these things. Incredible concentration of force. Oh, the U.S. has increased patrolling the South China Sea because of what China is doing. So this can easily do an advantage escalation, but also coercion of China to the U.S. allies. Look, I mean, conflicts with India. Look with everybody in its area. What the, the U.S. will force to take a stand. And by the way, if it doesn't take a stand, then Korea, Japan will know nuclear immediately. So the U.S. cannot afford not to back its allies. Korea. I mean, let's see how this will play out. Trump has drawn some red lines. The North Korean is not ready to yield. How this will be solved? I mean, it's, it's something that can easily involve China. Uh, in my analysis, by the way, the North Korean game, it's a way to pressure China more than using the help of China to solve the problem. But, you know, that's my strategic perspective on, on, on interpreting uh, the, the Korean thing. Energy competition, I mean, will, will go huge. Oh, China is fragile in terms of energy. The U.S. has energy domi dominance. I mean, how the Chinese will, uh, will react to all that? Taiwan, and most importantly, fears of regime change. I mean, the Chinese are very insecure. And all these kind of Arab type of revolutions or mid-class uh, getting more liberalization and democratization makes the regime go nuts. Uh, and all these structural elements will be interpreted that it's the Americans that they are doing kind of domestic instability and revolution. And this will drive the regime crazy. So a lot of things can go wrong. But now, let's come to you on the Cold War. Okay, when you have two powers, essentially US and China, and blocks, polarization, even Russia is leaning to China, and the other countries, Australia, India, 
Japan is leaning to the Korea, to the US. So you have a polarized system. There are only two possibilities. Cooperation, in other words, oligopoly, sit in a table, provide global leadership, divide the world, and run it together. You think the Americans will do it? No way. Now, if this is not happening, then there is one possibility, competition. And that competition is Cold War. Now, how the competition, it's exactly like the other Cold War. What the Americans did, containment. They built a chain around the Soviet Union. Look what they are doing right now around China. They are building a chain around China. Precisely containment. And as I implied, if it, the recent change with the Trump administration, the 80% engagement, 20% balancing, now it has become 80% balancing, 20% engagement. So it's complete Cold War. Unbrace uh, at all levels, including nuclear. Uh, the, uh, and more, uh, another situation, countries have to choose now, as you said. That's precisely what's happening in the Cold War. So at geopolitical level, we have a Cold War. Actually, it may be even at the ideological level. China slowly started exporting its type of state-run capitalism model, the state capitalism type of model. It's not clear yet, but I could see signs already. Now, if this is happening, it will also turn to ideological Cold War. But you see, Cold War not was, from my perspective, most importantly, geopolitical. And geopolitical is happening. China is trying to occupy Eurasia. I mean, that's Cold War. So it's happening. Cold War had rules, uh, which is another thing we could come back to. But Professor Young, please. Okay. Well, I think that this discussion becomes uh, more and more interesting. And first, I want to say that the whether we are going to have a Cold War is not only decided by motivation, also decided by capability. U.S. no longer have that capability to contain China. The question is not whether they want or not. Even they want, I just published an article in the uh, Washington Post. I just, even Trump want to uh, initiate a Cold War. It's beyond his capability. And the Chinese economy and the military to wave it into with the international world uh, economic system and the internet. We have developed a meal to meal relationship with more and more countries. And even America's allies, Thailand, Philippines, they start to have the military pro joint program with China. So I doubt, and uh, without this uh, allies' uh, military support, how can the Trump administration contain China? And I don't think it's impossible. And uh, economically, that's important. China already becomes the largest uh, tra trader of the world. And uh, if China do not want to economically contain the US, I think that's good enough. And so there's a misunderstanding in this region. In this region, people think that East Europe is more peaceful than East Asia. That's true. But uh, this is a vulnerable peace region than the solid peace region in East Asia. There uh, has never been a war for East Asia since 1991. And if Russia was included as a part of the Europe, you have experienced the war in Kosovo, in Chechnya, in the uh, 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 Ukraine, and in the uh, 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 Gluggia. Okay, so you have, a, in the last 30 years, you experienced four wars in this region. There's no war in East Asia. We have a more solid peace than East Europe. Suddenly, you're more peaceful. You take the Come war and very peaceful. Like you, you think, oh, go to war, fine, it's good, okay. So you're not angry with that. In East Asia, we're not peaceful. We, f we conf conf conflict against each other, and we have the problem in the South China Sea, and North Korea's nuclear issue, and uh, East Asia, but then we can keep all these uh, unpeaceful conflicts uh, from escalating into war. We can maintain the peace, okay. So how about the nuclear uh, uh, the, the, uh, domino, uh, uh, domino showing, that's a domino reaction, okay, of nuclear uh, domino. I think that's a kind of imagination. And from the early 60s, it's 60 years, 
And we imagine that if anyone in the East Asia possesses nuclear weapons, all of the other countries will. Actually, we find that even North Korea possesses nuclear weapons. South Korea said, no, we won't. Japanese said, no, we will not go to nuclear weapons. If they want to go to nuclear weapons, they can do that many years ago. The North Korea has carried out nuclear program since the, uh, 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 2000. And it's already 18 years. They already carried out the sixth nuclear test. So how many tests do you think North Korea and the, the South Korea and the Japan are waiting for to have their nuclear test? I think every time when North Korea have a new, more, one more nuclear test, like, okay, we're waiting for the next one. And every time they're waiting for the next nuclear test, and make the decision whether they will follow it suit or not. So from my understanding, even next time North Korea have the sixth nuclear test, Japan and the South, South Korea say, okay, we are waiting for the next one. We still have terms. So the cyber war, the same. And uh, we also scared ourselves be that by cyber in the, uh, in the transition period of the 2000s. We think that when we move into the new, uh, millennium, new millennium, we cannot deal with the two digitals because all this data at the beginning and no use two, uh, uh, only two, uh, two data, right? So we think we have big problem. So the so, millennium uh, worms, it did happen. So from my understanding, these things are certainly, I do not rule out there's a danger, but I don't think there's a big danger like World War II, World War I, even like the uh, uh, can echo with the Cold War. And uh, Cold War requires a certain condition. Cold War cannot occur, uh, happen without, a, uh, uh, without a, uh, the, the, the necessary condition. The three basic necessary conditions. First, the positive one is nuclear weapons. Prevent the direct <laughs> war between the major superpowers. And the two negative uh, 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 conditions. First, isolation. There's no any trade between US and the Soviet Union. No exchange, students exchange program, and no tourists, no cross countries marriages. So nowadays, every year, we have millions and millions of Chinese uh, studying in the US. And mean, meanwhile, we have tens of, tens of thousands of Americans studying at uh, 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 China. We, we have the over uh, uh, thousands of American kids come to China every year. So this is uh, another factor. The cold, during the Cold War, that not existed. And th second, uh, 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 fact, uh, the third fa factor for uh, the Cold War is the ideological uh, confrontation. For people, they can make concession on the what? The wealth, secular interests. But human beings are so strange. They're very stubborn, stand on their ideology. They will prefer to advance their ideology at the price of their life, right? We see in the Middle East, and for the religion's difference, for us, well, that's so minor difference. Why you fight against each other? We cannot understand them because we are Chinese uh, atheist. We do not have no religion. So we think, just, just you know, my experience that when I visited the Jerusalem, I said, hey, you tell me all of this. No, we are Chinese tourists, uh, uh, visitors. We said, hey, these are stories. What, the Israelis are very angry. Hey, hey, wait, wait a minute, this is not a story. This is history. For us, you are fight for stories. No, 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 they said we fight for the history. So, so that's a mentality. So, Okay, you, if you ask me what we go wrong, I think uh, if we maintain the so-called post-Cold post War mentality, it will cause a lot of big, big problems. Finally, I will say, the concept of engaging China should be changed. And uh, if you want to say, okay, we engage, why there's a problem between China and uh, the Western world, and that uh, there's a superiority over China? Hey, we should engage China. China says, wait, wait a minute. Do you agree I engage you? If you like this term, engage, or China. Okay, I'm going to engage you. So in the future, possibly we should use this concept, mutual engagement, at least, if not uh, only engage China. Thank you. We should start dating. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so th thank you very much. We started out this conversation. I was kind of optimistic that this was a, a kind of slow-moving, long-term competition, not too risk-prone, all the right. Now I'm worried, actually. Um, but... I'm, I'm going to turn to all of you. We have about a half an hour. If you would, just catch my eye, which you are doing, and also if you would tell us who you are and where you're from, that would be, that would be super. And maybe if I could start right here, Tim, please. Do we have a microphone in the room? Just in the front, please. Right here, right here. 
coming. <laughs> Who? What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Timothy Garden Ash, Oxford University, fascinating panel. I have a quick comment on Ivan's wonderful image of seeing cats or dogs, and then two simple questions. Um, I had the curious experience of being invited to brief President George W. Bush about Europe before his first official visit to Europe in the early summer of 2001. We had two and a half hours with him, and he had a geopolitical vision. Somewhat simplistic, but very clear. We used to have a global competition with the Soviet Union, now we have a global competition with China. China is a gate college, and apropos Russia, what he actually said, Chang Li, was Russia has no alternative long term but to go with the West. They've only got 15 million people east of the, uh, east of the, uh, of the Urals, and there's China rising up. So, I don't know if China's a cat or a dog, which, which is maybe the year of the dog. Should we say it's a dog? Okay, so he was seeing, he was seeing the dog. 9-11 happens, you make the point, and immediately everything changes, and there were only cats, and he's only seeing cats, and the Chinese dog is an ally in the struggle against terrorism, and you have what Richard Haas very well called a decade of strategic distraction. Then you have the global financial crisis, then the Obama administration starts to kind of refocus on what is clearly, a la long, the big geopolitical challenge, the rise of China, pivot to Asia, so what are we reading about every day on the front page of the New York Times? Russia. And we're back in a mental cold war with Russia. It is, I think, hard to find such an impressive example of strategic distraction by a relatively declining great power as that of the United States. Um, that's the comment. Two quick questions. First of all, you've been talking for 75 minutes. No one has mentioned the words, the West. Not once, the West. Are we therefore agreed that the West exists as a community of history, of culture, of values, but no longer as a geopolitical actor? That's question number one. Question number two to our Chinese panelists. Um, Tony Gardner made a, did a brilliant job of speaking for Europe, I have to say, better than almost any European could. Um, what is your view of the European Union as a geopolitical actor? 15 years ago, the Chinese view was we've got George W. Bush offering a unipolar world, the European Union is going to be another pole of a multipolar world. When I hear you speaking now, uh, it's very revealing you talked about Germany. You didn't talk about the European Union. So to the three of you, what's your view of the European Union as a geopolitical actor? Okay, the West. In the EU, please, Paul. Oh. And there'll be plenty of questions, so don't, don't feel compelled to come in on everything, but if it seizes you, please. Tony. Well, what an interesting point, strategic distraction. I couldn't agree more. I think you know, we haven't talked about economic competition. That's really where the story is. Who is gonna dominate the technologies of the future? This is not gonna be a uh, hot conflict. This is going to be who will determine the rules of trade and who will dominate the uh, technologies of the future, such as artificial intelligence, robotics, nanotechnology, data analytics, material science, cloud computing, supercomputing. That's the real story. And there, I think it's another example how China has been so strategic in its vision about identifying and increasingly dominating those technologies of the future. And the second, who's going, to, who's going to determine the rules of trade? And this is where I'm so sad, because we had an opportunity, I think we still do, for some period of time, maybe five to ten years left, to have worked with the EU, with our European friends, the West, to solidify our common values through trade agreements. And that's what TTIP was all about. It wasn't just an economic agreement, it was a political agreement. It had to embody in a trade agreement high standards, with regard to intellectual property, with regard to protection of labor rights, with regard to protection of environmental standards, and we have forfeited that very important window of opportunity. TPP has gone ahead, but minus the rules on intellectual property and minus the rules on investor state dispute settlement, which were two important parts of that agreement. The EU is doing its level best to sign up bilateral trade agreements, but that's no solution and no substitute for working together as the West, US and Europe, to promote its values through trade agreements. 
And I think that is one of the real sad chapters of um, the current time. So yes, I agree. Absolutely. Do you talk about the West? Does yeah. it exist? In China, we still use a, a term of West, uh, uh, very popular in media in academia. But personally, I think that's a very, very typical Cold War mentality. And uh, I just visited the National Museum at uh, Essence. And uh, when they're talking about West, and actually re result, uh, the view, the part of this, uh, the, uh, the others, the East started from uh, what? It's not Turkey, from the Eastern part of the, uh, 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 Greece. So the West is a geographical concept. Gradually developed into the cultural concept and in the Cold War becomes a political concept. So that's why even Japan is so Eastern from the Europe is regarded as a Western country, right? So this concept of West is already politicalized and is a political concept. So if you use the West, uh, uh, the term indicating the democracy, so then you find the Indian is the uh, uh, West. Then you have problems. How about uh, Palestine, uh, Pakistan? Pakistan is also election democracy. So people, oh, they say not uh, mature. Okay, there's a lot of a mature West and mature West and non mature West. So the fact that there's a problem, this concept can no longer explain the reality today. Today we cannot use the concept of East and West uh, to, an to analyze the real po politics. We can no longer use the North and the West the concept to analyze the, the, uh, the situation. We, it's difficult to use the con uh, concept of capitalism or socialism. So what a Chinese capitalism or socialism? Can any of you give me a clear definition to explain this is a socialist, co socialist country or co capitalist country? So now these concepts from my are out of date. We need a new format, we need a, a new concept to analyze the changing political reality. Yvonne, the West, Trump doesn't talk about the West either, you know. Yeah. I, I do believe that here the trick is the following. We always talk when it comes to the liberal order about two revisionist power, Russia and China. But you have three. Because the United States at the moment is also revisionist power when it comes to the liberal order. So from this point of view, I don't believe that President Trump is going to identify himself with the West in the way it functions in the post-Cold War period. So when he went to Warsaw, he tries to define the West in a cultural terms. West is basically the Christian Jewish tradition. If this is the case, that the West is only can function in Europe. So from this point of view, it's not going to be a global concept, it's going to be a regional concept because I cannot understand Indians very much, basically, <coughs> identifying with the Christian Jewish tradition. Uh, so, uh, and then comes two other questions. One is, can the United States, in this new situation, preserve the Cold War alliances system? And this is an open question. Uh, this is an open question, Pakistan being one of the great examples of how it works, basically. Uh, uh, and my, I'm going to ask, uh, and with a question. We talk about Cold War. Cold War cannot function in the state of a global economy. If you go to a Cold War, you're going to go basically with a very much regional economic blocks. And for me, the question is, what is the meaning of sphere of influence today? People like to talk about sphere of influence. What does it mean? Is it defined by nature of the regime? Is it by trade patterns? Is it by what kind of a basically internet search machine you're using? Is it informational sphere of influence? And for me, this is a question that is not answered, and people are basically very easily using the concept of the 19th century or the Cold War to try to put it in the world which basically probably does not fit to it. Yeah, can I? Can sure, I briefly, please. Uh, you know, one thing struck me uh, in recent months uh, is that the how Western countries to unify to a certain extent about the fear about China's threat. Again, I do not want to make a statement this is a, um, EU or European country or a so-called West is a monolithic group, they're different. But again, you look at the media, uh, the main, mainstream media in the United States, in Europe, I mean in uh, 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 EU, Western countries, especially, there's a lot of criticism, dominated by one-sided criticism. Now, 
again, this is actually, I'm not a person really obsessed with this term. I agree with uh, Professor Yan Zhetong, and certainly also do not seek, uh, think that China has an ideology wanted to defeat the West, defeat the United States. This is complete nonsense. One thing that China developed over the past 30 years is the rule of law as a direction, of course, that someone wants to change it. But uh, rule of law is very much a Western concept. It's uh, not in the Chinese tradition. I think this is a dramatic, uh, very uh, important change. But uh, I mean, this reminds me that, uh, again, for Chinese decision makers, I mean, leadership, they need to be sensitive about uh, uh, this. But from us, um, from us, I'm sorry, this, I'm switching my identities. <laughs> you know, again, I caught up in such a, a terrible situation. For the West, we should avoid um, really obsess our, uh, the view that uh, do not look at the complicated reality in China. This reminds my uh, good friend, his name, his artist, his name is Xu Bing, probably you, uh, some of you know him. He got the MacArthur Award, and probably is the, the most uh, accomplished uh, avant-garde artist in China. He created the Chinese characters, look like Chinese characters, but actually it's English. I mean, he sent me one, it's actually Happy New Year, but look at the Chinese. But for those people, they think this is Chinese, but actually it's, it's, a, it's English. So you do see the class culture, misunderstanding, misperception. We use our own mentality, own tradition, own religious beliefs to impose a lot of things. Actually, it's not from China. Of course, that uh, when China become important, the outside world has a legitimate reason to be concerned. But I still do not see China has ambition to dominate the world, to become a new imperial power. I think there's some, at least there's some things in Chinese tradition against that. That explains with why Chinese civilization continue for so long. So I think that's, uh, I, mean, I do not have a clear answer for you, but just want to look at the issues in a different way. But actually, more instructed by it at the moment, I hope that it will be not lasting. It's only one voice. Do not look at the different uh, 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 you know, scenarios. Think everything is predetermined, that China predetermined to do ABC. That's really, if you treat China as enemy, of course China sooner or later will become enemy. And the China versus West, it will be a disaster. It's certainly, I agree with uh, Professor Yan and uh, my Chinese colleague. Actually, probably China really, the person or the force try to undermine liberal order, it's not from China. It's, uh, you know, you know the answer, who and, uh, and where try to challenge that uh, liberal order. Okay, there are a lot of hands in the room, and what I'd suggest we do, if you agree, is that we take... Okay, very brief, please. Okay, on strategic destruction. I mean, it's clearly strategic destruction. Russia is a regional declining power. It has to choose between two evils the US and China. Tactically, it's leaning toward China. Strategically, it will understand that China is a bigger threat. Demographically, uh, uh, trying to occupy essentially Eurasia. So strategically, they will understand that they will lean to the other pole. So at the moment, yes, it's a distraction. Now on the West, I did not use this term because geopolitically, it's not relevant. I mean, I talk about two poles, which includes US, Europe, India, and Japan. That's the competing. The West is a cultural thing, not relevant for the geopolitical competition. Now, on the issue, I think you have grossly misunderstood uh, US power. I mean, the coalition that just described control 70% of the world GDP. And I gave in the beginning some of the statistics, but I didn't talk about the qualitative element. If the difference between US and China is one to seven, one to 10, if you put the qualitative element, it's one to 20, one to 50. So it will take a lot of time for, for the China to compete and very easily for the United States to have a Cold War if it chooses to. And I think structurally they're moving there. Okay, thank you. Okay, lots of, lots of hands. I'd suggest we take a couple of uh, points and then we can come back to them yeah. to wrap up. So maybe just right there, someone has the microphone and then we'll come to the front again and go to the back. I can speak now, right here? Okay. Uh, hello, 
my name is Joros Christidis. I'm the Greece correspondent of German uh, news magazine uh, Der Spiegel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just take a, a minute of your time. I have a report here um, uh, that says, I'll be very brief. Uh, in June 2017, Greece blocked an EU statement at the UN Human Rights Council criticizing China's human rights record. Uh, then it says Greece and the Czech Republic watered down the language of the European Council statement announcing a planned e EU investment screening mechanism for Chinese investment. Uh, I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, in summer 2017, uh, Greece uh, said that uh, investment coming from China uh, uh, is, is, you know, uh, vital for the country's uh, rebirth and uh, economic development. And all this, in the, in the conclusion of the report, is that China is using its cloud, uh, its economic cloud, uh, to, and its soft power uh, to uh, promote its agenda in Europe in various ways, uh, ultimately undermining liberal values of Europe, and we should put an end to that. Uh, I'm not endorsing, obviously, this conclusion, but I would be very ha uh, happy to hear your thoughts about this. No, thank you very much. And if we could go right in the front with the microphone, please. Thank you very much. Congratulations to the panel for very, very uh, interesting and uh, inspiring comments. My name is Margarita Matiopoulos. I'm professor of US foreign policy at the University of Potsdam. Two brief comments. First of all, to Ambassador Gartner, I think this is the key element for the coming decades about the democratic destruction and recession. And uh, you mentioned Turkey and uh, Poland and Hungary. Unfortunately, I would like to add also my own country, Germany. Um, we have now a party called AfD, which entered the Bundestag, the 93 uh, MPs. Um, and I would call them actually Nazis. I know this is a very tough term. Uh, but we really have to watch it, and I think we could have pro prevented that. Of course, this is a very big discussion, uh, but it is something which is uh, really very awkward and dangerous. Uh, on on uh, Russia, as there is no Russian in the room, and of course I'm not going to defend the Russians as a German, but I think uh, as a Westerner, and this is my compassion and identity as a European and as a German, uh, I would like also to say what, what went wrong. Uh, and what went wrong is that uh, at the very beginning, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, there was, in my view, a t totally unnecessary triumphalism in the West, uh, in, in the US, as well as in Europe. Uh, and um, there was, at the beginning, a very modest and sincere attempt by the Russians to have a Como with us. I remember 2001, Putin coming to Berlin, speaking in the German parliament, in the Bundestag, in German, and offering uh, a, a very serious cooperation. Um, I thought that that was the beginning of uh, a, an opportunity we did not grab in Germany. Secondly, I will never forget uh, the, 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 the comments of Primakov, one of the most brilliant, I think, Russian minds, uh, saying that uh, if, if the West doesn't want to work with us, then we have to work with the Chinese and Indians. Um, we didn't take it seriously. Um, thirdly, 2007, uh, sitting in the Munich uh, uh, conference and Putin giving us uh, a very hard, harsh lecture, again, very few people in the room took seriously what he was saying. Now, Kissinger is right. If, if, if we treat the Russians like demons, they, they become demons, and today they are very aggressively. Uh, but on the other hand, I think if we want to look uh, ahead what the challenges are, we also should look back what the West, and as a Westerner, German and European, uh, I would also like to see what mistakes uh, we did. So I think it's very important uh, to, no, to, to acknowledge this. And it is also, I think, our mistake that today there is this relationship uh, between Russia and, and China, which uh, actually we help very much uh, to become one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Fight Lucas, please. And I'll work my way over to the other side of the room as well, so. Very briefly, Lucas Sukalis from Elia Meb. Uh, many people, are, people around the table have expressed doubts as to whether we should use terms like spheres of influence or new Cold War in the context of global economic interdependence. 
I have a very simple question addressed to all of you. To what extent do you think that global economic interdependence is reversible? Thank you very much. And just right, right there <laughs> on the aisle, please. I'll circle around, not to worry. Very briefly, uh, thank please. you. So my name is Sonia. I grew up in Malaysia, and I currently attend Wesleyan University in America. Uh, I have a question particularly for the uh, Chinese uh, professors here. China has been quick to latch their economic influence across African mining industries in the South China Sea in emerging Asian markets. We've seen that with the One Belt, One Road initiative and as well as strong military exercises carried out in the South China Sea. Though some have labeled it as economic imperialism and causing these industries to be dependent or interdependent on China, um, do you see the US taking comparable measures either now or in the future to win over Asian markets? Okay, thank you very much. And by the window, please, just over there. My name is Tanya Vujic, I'm a journalist, Daily Politica, Belgrade, Serbia. A question for a Chinese professor speaking at the end of the session. You said that the lesser states would have one day to choose between two big superpowers. Could you define the lesser state? Could you say what happens? What's the criteria of choosing? And what happens if you choose the wrong side? Thank you. <laughs> I'm tempted to say the lesser state is my state, but I, I don't think that's what you meant. <laughs> It's a good question. It's a good question. I think we have time for one more. Going once, going twice, right there, please. Uh, very quickly, uh, Romolo Gandolfo from College Year in Athens. I wanted to ask the panel whether the codependence between America and China regarding America's growing government deficit and foreign debt. As we discovered in Greece, the relationship between creditors and debtors, it's a very complicated one. And who is holding this, this you know, the, <laughs> the debt issue? So, let me come back to our group. Uh, don't feel compelled to talk about all of the points that were raised, but do just take two minutes, <laughs> even a minute, uh, an opportunity to respond to something that was of interest to you. So please go ahead, uh, Professor, if I might start with you. Okay, I use the two minutes to answer four questions. And the first, I think the Europeans are ready to take sides between China and the US when China continue to advocating the free trade and the America advocating for the fair trade. And the same thing, the European countries uh, and take sides at the Chinese, Chinese side. And I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate to you. And second is the EU. And the EU by now do not have a, a, code, number, a code number for this uh, uh, phone. So it's an international organization. It cannot play the function of the states. And the third, and the globalization, and uh, that depends on how do you define it. My understanding, globalization not only means a free trade and a free flow of the capital. It also means a free flow of terrorism and the free flow of the disease, free flow of the uh, pollution. So negative part of the globalization is gaining momentum. It's become stronger and stronger. No one can, if we do not work together, I don't think any, uh, anyone can reverse it. So when we're talking about why is, who can we reverse the globalization, and that depends on what you're talking about, positive side or negative side. Actually, the two sides go, go, uh, went together. And the last question is about the, uh, what this, economic, Oh, uh, economic imperialism. Well, when any country have a stronger economy, they will invest it in the other, uh, uh, outside, uh, beyond their borders. If China's behavior is defined as imperialism, and the Germany is, is European imperialism, they invite it in the older European countries, right? So invest, foreign investment cannot be used as an indicator as a, a economic imperialism. 
Well, I completely agree with Margarita that we made a lot of mistakes vis-à-vis -vis Russia, but I think they are reversible. The more that they will realize the Chinese threat, they will change policy. Now, on Professor Tsoukalis interdependence, I mean, interdependence is here to stay, but this doesn't mean that we will not have trade wars and rise of protectionism in certain areas. But the liberal assumption that interdependence leads to peace is completely wrong. Look what happened before World War I. Interdependence was high and World War I happened. And actually, the fact that we have interdependence and due to the geopolitical competition that I have outlined, it makes the relation worse. Because the closer you are when you compete, you have more instruments and lever of powers to exercise. And precisely this has been played right now in the international system. Now, on China, I was slightly more polite uh, than the young lady. I call it revisionism, uh, which I think uh, imperialism is valued, um, loaded to world. The fact is that China wants, to China wants to change the status quo. And it's using, of course, where the means that are strong, economic. The whole Silk Road is a geoeconomic instrument to increase China geopolitical power. Uh, and it's naturally the Chinese to compete on their strength and not where they are weak on the military level. And that's precisely what you expect to do and that's precisely what they are doing. Thank you. Professor Lee. Well, let me answer the question whether the globalization economic trend uh, started a few decades ago or even earlier are uh, irreversible. Uh, I do not have the concrete answer because it all depends on the discourse which is happening like this one. I think that uh, in the United States, in Washington, where I come from, there are three waves regarding China. They are all quite negative. First is the trade war. And uh, of course, that um, you see legitimate concern on the US part with the intellectual property rights, China's market access, China's protectionism, trade deficit. But the, uh, to raise that issue is one thing. To launch an all round trade war with China is another thing. I think the major companies in the United States, when they realize the, uh, the major war is uh, on the horizon, they will go against that. But that's the first competition we are yet to see. Secondly, of course, because based on our discussion, we understand why there's a growing fear about China as a threat to national security and the global international order. But it's a, this is one thing to prepare, to be cautious, and to want to warn and to observe. But it's quite another thing to contain China or have a, a prepare a real all around the war. Fighting with China, I mean, for what? And uh, whether we can avoid, I think the political establishment will start to discuss that issue. At the moment, there are certain things more to do with our worry about Donald Trump and, uh, rather than China. So that debate is yet to happen. If you look at the, the Senate hearing, these uh, uh, previous uh, uh, leaders, like uh, Henry Kissinger, you name it, they all think that uh, it's not a smart move to go that kind of war, conflict with China. Finally. Do you really want to have a cultural war with China? To basically, you cut off all the foreign students, 400,000. Do you think American university president will buy it? And also, do you think really people think that the culture exchanges, education exchange is such a horrible thing? If you believe that, I don't believe that. I think majority of my colleagues will not believe that. So, so I think that the debate will shape our future. Thank you very much. Yvonne, yeah, um, please. Uh, ju just two points. Uh, uh, the first point is China has one major structural advantage when it comes to dealing with Europe. And this is that East European states are so much obsessed with Russia that they always believe that China is coming as a countervailing power. So paradoxically, in a certain way, the success of China in Europe starts from the fact that Poles and others do not see China and Russia as natural allies 
but as a natural opponents. And I do believe, unless this is not going to change, Europe is never going to be able to speak about that. China, not even to act about China. And the second, uh, what Lucas said, I do believe that there is one important thing that in my view is going to affect very much the state of the global economy. And this is the proliferation of sanctions on the American side. And this time it's not Trump, it's the Congress. Because the Congress, for very good reason, being mistrustful to President Trump, decided to have a foreign policy of their own, but the only thing that they can do on their own is to sanction. If the United States decided to basically broaden the countries which they're sanctioning on, they're going to be incentives for people, and particularly for China, to try to create a global infrastructure different than the existing one. And part of the major strengths of the West comes from the fact that we control the infrastructure. Asian Development Bank was a great example of this. The moment you're keeping the Chinese out of the World Bank and IMF and so on, they're going to come with a project of their own. And then this type of a destruction of the global economy, in my view, is going to very much to follow the security alliances. Bon, thank you. Dr. He, very briefly. OK, I will say something about the software about China. I think, uh, uh, you know, I think the definition about software is that that's something in mind, not the business, not the economic. Uh, software is about the, something in mind or something about the language and culture. It's not the, about the, the economic. I think the, the uh, China invested in, in Europe, the successful um, cases is that the Paris project in, in Greece, as we know. And, and, and the statistics show that there are about additional 5.1 billion uh, e uh, Europe of long-term economic benefits to uh, Greece. And uh, by 2052, we'll end a, a total of 100, uh, one, uh, yeah, um, 150 and, and 22,000 jobs for Greeks. So I think it's a, it's a very uh, uh, great, uh, you know, uh, a project for, for both sides. And also very uh, successful cases for the uh, a cooperation between China and Europe. Uh, so, uh, so for the soft power, I think if uh, if if someone just like uh, just look at this uh, this kind of inv investment is a kind of soft power. I think if uh, if other countries just just uh, invest in China, I think uh, the Chinese government is just uh, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. A last word. Very brief. I think everything is reversible. Nothing is irreversible. Already World War I was invoked, Smoot-Hawley tariffs in the interwar period, and today we're seeing a potential reverse of the multilateral rules-based system that's under attack, not just the dispute settlement body, which could perhaps stop, stop functioning if we continue blocking the appointments of uh, members of the appellate body, but more importantly, the new policy that the United States reserves arrogates to itself the ability to ignore adverse WTO rulings invoking national security at a time of peace to impose tariffs on imported steel and aluminum from allies, from allies, from Canada, from Europe. These are significant things, so of course it's reversible, and we should be careful what we wish for. Um, so uh, I, I think a lot, of, a lot is at stake. Tony, thank you. Uh, Please join me in thanking all of our speakers. I hope you'll agree this was really an extraordinary, an extraordinary conversation.